permission to. So um, it's it's all up to you what you want to do here. Let me see. I let some other folks in the room. And I'm going to let, I'm trying to let everybody record if they want to. All right. But I will be sending out a replay. Okay. Dispositions, lease option dispositions in detail, everybody. That's the topic. So I put a, a link in the chat room here in Zoom. It'll be available for anybody that's getting the replay here too. Thanks for being here today on Saturday, right in the middle, smack dab middle of your day. I hope that I make the next 60 to 90 minutes very much worth your time. If you have questions about lease options, dispositions in detail, my hope is today will be a very basic but extremely thorough example <clears throat> of lease options, um, dispositions in detail. And so the ebook is actually our manual, I guess you could say, for today. So if you have this link, you should be able to open this ebook here. It's a detailed case study. And I just want to mostly go through today what the entire experience of a lease options dispositions is like. Now, one thing I will say, there's a caveat to it. Um, a couple things you need to know. Number one, this was a this is a deal that we we did here in the club just like a month ago. Um, two different students of mine uh, or club members here uh, in the club did this deal together. One was the acquisitions guy, and one was the dispositions guy, and then I'm just a coach guy. Okay, so this detailed case study is. The acquisitions guy is Rico, and the dispositions guy is Lou, all right? So the reason I chose this particular deal to do this as a, as a, to use as a case study is because this deal is pretty funny, all right? It's not the biggest deal. It's not the best deal. It certainly wasn't the easiest deal. This deal had more in dispositioning it. It had more problems and hangups than 99.9% .9 of all lease option dispositions. And when we say dispositions, I'm talking about finding and working with tenant buyers, placing them into your lease option deal and getting money. Okay. So this particular example is pretty far out. All right. But it has a lot of great content in the sense that it will teach you a lot of different things when things go wrong what to do, how to think about them, what to say, so on and so forth. All right, so it's a pretty lengthy book, but it's pretty fun to read, I believe. It's easy to get through. It's it's a lot of uh, kind of what we're used to reading here today as far as social media goes. So it's pretty fun to pretty fun to get through. And the hero of the story is with us here today. <laughs> the hero of the story is Lou, and he's actually in the room. So what I'd like to do, hey, welcome, Lou. Thanks for being here, man. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just make this a real informal 60 to 90 minutes and let's let's have you, those that are attending here, interrupt me, ask questions, okay? Um, dig deep, okay? Because we want to we wanna really have a detailed understanding of lease options dispositions when we leave here today. So that may depend on you asking great questions. All right, there's no dumb questions. There's just questions, and I want to answer them for you today. So feel free to speak up. Okay, so does everybody, let's just start out. Does everybody have the ebook? Did everybody get access to it? Okay, great. All right, so the first thing I want to draw your attention to in the ebook is on page six. And what we have here is a dispositions checklist. This is the process for lease options disposition. Now, you'll notice there are some words written in red, okay? These are words that you will actually want to use, all right? So, very important to understand that you can actually use these words as what you should say. So, the very first thing we're going to do, once we get a property deal under contract, lease options with the homeowner, is we are going to 
number one, we're going to review the property numbers and decide what we need to mark the property up to. Okay. I'm going to give you an example here when, when we get into the case study, but we're going to have to mark the property up. So if the property is 250,000, we're going to have to mark it up to 260,000 so that we can make 10,000 spread. Okay. So we, we need to review the numbers. We need to make sure that we have the right rent amount and everything so that when we build our ads, we'll have the right information. We may need to order a lockbox and send the lockbox to the homeowner to put on the home. Now, this is a big, big tip. And I got this from a good friend. Um, he, he taught us that the easiest way to do this, and I was doing it differently until then, but, but this is so smart, is when you talk to the homeowner, you want to simply ask this question, Mr. Homeowner, what was your plan for allowing us to get our people into the home to view it? Okay, you're going to get a one of a few answers. You're going to get a, well, I'll show the property. Okay, well, I've got, I've got, I've got a method for you if he wants to show the property. Number two, he might say, well, I have a lockbox on it. Or number three, he might say, well, I've got a neighbor or a brother or somebody that'll let somebody in. Okay, you just let me know and I'll let them in. Usually it's one of those three things. So what we suggest is, is we suggest that you offer the homeowner, hey, Mr. Homeowner, would it help? if I sent you a lockbox. Now you might be thinking, how can I send the guy a lockbox? And why would I want to do this? Well, if you put a lockbox on the front door, Mr. Homeowner, with a key in it, then I don't have to bug you or your brother. I'll let you know when we're coming to the property and when we're leaving the property so you, you can keep track of things. But this way it won't inconvenience anybody and we can come and go as we need to. So would you like me to send you a lockbox, Mr. Homeowner? If the, if the homeowner says sure, and sometimes they do, then what I'll do is, is I'll go to amazon.com. Okay. You guys know about Amazon, right? I spend a lot of money on Amazon. It seems I get this little notification every month that says how much money I've spent. And it's just, it blows my mind. Um, how much money I've spent on lot on different things. Lock boxes may be one of those things in the month that I spend money on, but you can see there's some pretty cheap ones here. All right. So what you do is you would just order a lockbox and you would have it sent because Amazon will mail it wherever you want to mail it. OK, so this is actually one of my favorite ones. It's a, it's 33 bucks, but this is a great lockbox, especially if you're local and you want to keep the lockbox. In other words, if you're doing a local deal and you take this lockbox over and you put it on a local property that you're trying to dispo, this is a great lockbox to own. All right easy for the tenant buyers to use, easy for you to reset the codes and do everything. It's super, super good. All right. But you can see there are much cheaper alternatives that will work as well. All right. So have that sent directly to the homeowner if that's what he wants or she wants. Okay. That's what I do. Now, the next thing we want to do now that we've reviewed the numbers and we've got a lockbox or we've figured out how we're going to show the property, the homeowner's going to do it or what have you. What we're going to do next is, is we're going to build our Facebook ad, the marketplace listing. And I'm going to recommend now that you start also using the app called Nextdoor. Okay. Nextdoor. Next door, N E X T D O O R. It's an app. It's a very, it's like a very localized neighborhood Facebook. Okay. That's the best way that I can describe it. Very local neighborhood oriented. All right. And let me see if I can find, I don't know if I can pull it up real quick. I sh wish I'd have thought of this earlier. I will try to log in right now to my next door app. And happening here oh there we go I might be able to do this okay let me get a link and I'll share this with you guys this is what it looks like to be on next door all right I gotta I gotta find a link here hold on it's here somewhere <laughs> be patient with me please okay there it is I've got it all right, I'm going to put a link in the chat room here so you can click this. But look what I've done here on Nextdoor. It's a very localized Facebook-type neighborhood thing. 
and you can see uh, if you click that link, it says Justin's business. It's Justin's business page on Nextdoor, and it says I take over house payments. Walk away today. Okay. Now, what's great about this is that's my business page, but I can also I can also create listings. Like I can I can list a house for sale. Okay. Um, I can sell sell my wares. Does that make sense? Can't see anything, Justin. Oh, when you click the link, do you see anything? Let me see. What what pops up when you click the link? Okay, I see it. Okay, when you click the link, it should pop up something like I'll pull it up on my screen here and then uh share my screen. It's good to see Lenny pop in here too. I take over house payments walk away today. Okay, this is my business page on Nextdoor. Okay. Now, Nextdoor is not going to let you have 10 listings in 10 different cities. It's very localized, so you you're going to have one at a time or you're going to have to open up several accounts, okay? Um that's okay. I've tested that. You can do that. Um, but this is, I recommend having a business page and this is what mine looks like. It's very, very simple. It's basically a picture and a title. It's got my contact information. All right. I, I didn't, I didn't see a great category for, I take over house payments as a business. So I chose notary and home and garden service. I, <laughs> I don't know. They didn't have a great category for it, but now I guarantee you though, Everybody in my neighborhood around locally where I live or wherever I've set this up, okay, and I do have I do have it set up in a couple different places now. And this this here is being exposed to all my neighbors. Okay, so my neighbors now all get to see that I take over house payments. And you can see from the here's what a property listing looks like on next door. Okay. So you can see you can actually list your property deals here. Now, just so you know, I live in Independence and Perryville is about 350 miles from where I live and I have an account there also, okay? So next door is a way to really start. You really definitely want to do Facebook Marketplace, all right? And you really want to do next door, all right? Now, do I need to spend any time here today talking about building a Facebook marketplace listing? I'll give you an example of one here shortly. It's pretty simple to build a Facebook marketplace listing. And I'll tell you this, you don't want to use pictures that you downloaded straight right off of Zillow. You want to have pictures. You've If you do that, you, you're going to get put in Facebook jail. You're going to have to open up the pictures of the house and save them to a new file. So it has, it doesn't have a Zillow geo hidden tag on it okay you're gonna want to definitely have original type pictures or at least original file names okay upload those use those start in the for rent section okay so in other words when you go here to your facebook marketplace listings and you want to start adding a listing, you're going to click this, create a new listing in Facebook Marketplace. You're going to click the home for sale or rent. And you're going to start out doing for rent. Okay. If you're doing a lease option, you want to do a for rent side. What I find is, is I will run an ad in the for rent, not an ad, but a listing, free listing. It's all free on the for rent section for a couple, two, three weekends. Okay, I used to say weeks, but it's not clear. I really need it to be two, three weekends before I judge. And if I'm not getting a lot of traction, then I'll I'll move it to the for sale side. Now, how do you move it to the for sale side? You take it completely down off of the for rent side, and then you create a new listing on the for sale side. Unfortunately, Facebook is very, very ruthless when it comes to this. If you have the pictures that are right from Zillow that you didn't open up and save in a new file name before using them on Facebook, then they'll they'll throw you in Facebook jail. If you have a listing that's the same in the in the for rent side and you try to add the same in the for sale side, most of the time you end up in Facebook jail. Okay. 
you have to have one or the other. So I recommend having Facebook Marketplace for rent first. If that's not getting you traction, take it down and then add a new listing of the same property in the for sale side and see if you get traction there. Okay. I mostly get traction in the for rent side. I hope that makes sense, everybody. Now, when you do things on next door, you just add a listing and it's in your local neighborhood or the local neighborhood that you've created an account in. So you don't have all these problems. They're, they're very forgiving over at next door. Okay. So just, just some tidbits there. You can't, you can't play any shenanigans with Facebook. They will put you in Facebook marketplace jail. Unfortunately, that's just how they are. Okay. Once you start getting leads in, you're going to want to pre-qualify those contacts as they people start reaching out to you about your ad. And here's the questions you want to ask written in red on the actual process for lease options dispositions here on page six. All right. I don't know if Lenny's got this uh, link yet. She popped in just a few minutes ago, and I, I don't think she's got this link in the chat. Will somebody repost that link in the chat for this ebook, please? I want to make sure everybody in the room has it. I'm on page six right now, and the questions that we want to know are Do you want to rent to own, not just rent? So when a prospect comes to you, it's going to be happening over message. You're not talking about phone calls here yet. So you want to respond when someone says, hey, is this still available or whatever question they have about the home. The first thing you want to say is, is yes, it's available. Do you want to rent to own, not just rent? Have you seen the pictures in the description? The monthly rent is blank. Does that sound comfortable? Okay. What you're looking for ultimately is somebody that's making at least three times that amount in income. The rent to own program requires a minimum down payment investment. How much are you working with? All right. Number f the, the, the next one, have you driven by the property and made sure you like it and the neighborhood? And oftentimes they don't even know what the address is. They haven't read the description even. So asking these questions eliminates 99.999 percent of all the tire kickers. Okay, so let's get into, we'll, we'll get into the case study here in a minute. I just want, this is just an overview real quick, but then the case study, I'm going to have Lou really kind of speak up and tell us his experience here with it also. Now, the next thing we do once we have someone who's gone through our questions, these are our pre-qual questions that we're asking the prospect tenant buyer, and they have responded positively in a way that's pleasing to us in all of these questions. The next thing we want to do is we want to set up a call. It's a three minute call. We can do it over zoom or, or on the phone. And we want to confirm the answers to those questions. Okay. Now, when we start talking about money, we want to find out, are they making three times the rent? This is going to happen on the phone call. And they do want to rent to own. How much money do they have as a down payment? And then you want to ask, do you have that available today if you want to do this deal to start buying this house or not? In other words, you're trying to find out when or if they truly have this money. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of times you will have people that say, oh, I have, you might say, yeah, we're looking for a, a down payment for this property. They might say, well, how much are you looking for? Okay, well, that's not in the script. So what I recommend is you you choose whatever number that you've inflated your price by, let's say 10,000. Well, let's actually use the number that's gonna be used in the case study we're gonna get into here in a minute. It was 22,500. Yes, we're looking for 22,000, Mr. Tenant Buyer, we're looking for $22,500 down. Is that something you can do? Well, we have 20,000. Okay. 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 You have 20,000. You don't have 22,500. Now I'll, I'll let Lou give us some details on this conversation, but 
But watch this next sentence here. Mr. Tenant Buyer, if we schedule to get you inside and take a look at the property right away, and if you like it and want to move forward, are you willing to have all adults that are going to be living in the home start the application process, background screens, and lock this home in as your own? I'm talking about money. Okay. If that is a positive answer, we are really fishing now. We've really got somebody on the hook. Okay. If if none of this is 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 feeling right, if it's feeling sketchy to you. If they have a story like, oh, well, we have the money. I just have to get it from my grandma. Or we have the money. I have a settlement coming. And the lawyer says it'll be here. Well, that's not having the money. Okay. I've heard all of these things. Well, I have a tax return coming. Great. When will you have it? Okay. We don't want to do deals with potential money. We want to do deals with money. So this brings up a real strong mindset point here. A lot of times we're chasing homeowners to get deals. I understand that. You're following up. You're calling them. You're, you're trying to make them like you. You're, you're letting them know, hey, this deal, I'll, I'll cater this deal to fit you, Mr. Homeowner. You know, what will it take for you and me to do a, do a deal? What, what should I change to make things more comfortable? comfortable for you, Mr. Homeowner, so that this is something you're willing to do with me. That might be my attitude with a seller, but that cannot be my attitude with tenant buyers. It cannot be my attitude with prospect tenant buyers. Prospect tenant buyers, I need to be, can I use the word hard ass? Does everybody know what the word hard ass means? Okay, everybody does. Yeah. You know, when I was a young man, my dad, he, he used to look at me and he used to say, you know what your problem is? You're just a hard ass. You expect everybody to, to toe the line. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of am. And that fits this business really well. Because if you don't have a hard ass, then somebody's going to take you. They'll lie to you. Buyers are liars, especially tenant buyers. Okay. They're liars about the money. Well, I got the money. Great. You got the money. It's like that movie, My Cousin Vinny. Remember he got, she got tricked up by the, the pool. She was playing hustling pool and the guy didn't pay. And so Vinny goes over and he's like, hey, you owe her 200 bucks. Oh, I got the money. Yeah. Oh, you do? Let me see it. Over my dead body. Oh, a counter offer. Okay. So he didn't have the money. He only said he had the money. So People like to say they have the money because they think they can get it, but they don't have the money. Okay, so you really want to be a hard ass when it comes to tenant buyers. You do not want to end up showing the property to somebody that doesn't make at least three times the rent, have decent job history and some decent rental history, willing to submit to a background check, and is um, and has got the money down. Okay. Another thing I throw in there, of course, it's in the red here, is have they driven by and seen the property? Okay. Now, if all of those things and they're still chasing you, and by the way, I'm saying that purposefully, chasing you, the right one will chase you a bit. Okay. Now, you might have to do follow-up, and we're going to talk about that later. You might have to chase them a little bit and follow up, but for the most part, you're not chasing them like you would a homeowner. Okay. You're just trying to you're trying to do the deal with the tenant buyer, but you, you can't have this, I'm chasing you and can I make this fit? And oh, you know, cause they will eat your lunch then waste your time. All right. So if everything seems pretty successful with the conversation and this seems like a pretty solid tenant buyer, then what you're going to do is you're going to say now that uh, let's pick a time, let's pick a time. When can I get you into the house? I've got a lockbox on it, or I need to let the homeowner know and we'll get, we'll get scheduled. But when is a good time for you to see the inside of the property, Mr. Tenant Buyer? Now that we've picked a time, I'll be sending you our appointment confirmation memo. memo. And I'll show you what this is here in just a little bit in the, in the case study. This keeps everyone safe and allows us to know who's been inside the home. You won't have a problem with verifying your identity to us with an ID, would you? Okay. Now, some, sometimes this feels uncomfortable, but I'm telling you, it's not a bad question to ask. 
Sometimes you can go to their social media profiles and see that these people are legit. Okay. They look like they have a job. They look like they have, they pay their bills. They look like decent folk. Sometimes you can go to their social media and because they're messaging you and you can see that they're, 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 can I use the word flaky? Okay. But in this case, if you don't have any of those things and you can't, then what you must do is ask them to prove who they are with an ID. Just take a snapshot of something and send me an ID. Okay. I don't care what it is. I just want to make sure that I'm sending the right people to the house. The reason why this is important because you don't want to send somebody to a house that's going to murder somebody in the house. <laughs> all right. Now you think that sounds crazy and far out, but man, we live in a crazy world. All right. If you go apply for an apartment today, here's what will happen. You're going to walk into the apartment building in the office up front and some girl's going to say, Oh, Hey, how can I help you? And you're going to say, yeah, I'd like to take a look at a, a two-bedroom apartment. I'd like to rent an apartment. Oh, great. We've got one. We'll show you. I just need an ID. And they're going to hold your driver's license at the front office while, while one or two ladies goes up and shows you the apartment. Because if you rape and murder her while you're up there, they'll know who you are. Okay. We don't play around with, oh, well, somebody that I knew on Facebook, but I don't really know them and I don't know their real name or nothing. You know, when I, when I look at social media, it looks like their name is Peter Pan and I sent them over to the house to look at, okay, this, this is part of not chasing the tenant buyer. Hey, listen, Mr. Tenant buyer, if you want to, if you want to potentially own this property, then you're going to have to prove who you are. Okay. Cause we don't just show the property to anybody that says, oh, I want to see it. Okay, that's the attitude you have to have. All right. Once you have this cleared with this person that this and, this, and it's not so complicated. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the, the, the darker side of it. But most folks are just good people still. Okay. So most of the time, this conversation, when you find the right one that has contacted you, they'll answer these questions beautifully and they'll want to go see the house and they'll have no problem showing you who they are. Or you'll have no problem going to their social media and knowing that this is a real legitimate individual looking for a place to live. Okay. Now you're going to send the social, you're going to send the appointment confirmation memo. I'll show you what that is here in a minute. You're going to share the lockbox code with them. You're going to call the tenant buyer. I like to have the tenant buyer call me when they see the property, when you get there, let me know you're there. When you get the key out of the lockbox, call me. Okay. A lot of times I'll try to stay on the phone with them the whole time they're there looking. This is a big help too, especially if the homeowner is lurching around someplace. All right. If you can't do that, then at least Mr. Tenant Buyer, call me when you put the key back and lock it up. I need to know that the house has been secured. Okay. Now, this is also a great opportunity to ask this follow-up question after they've seen the house. How do you like it and are we moving forward? Okay. From there, you're going to start an application on mysmartmove.com. I'm going to give you an example of that. We're going to show you this in the case study. Mysmartmove.com is how it's TransUnion, the credit reporting bureau, and they're going to they're going to basically uh, do background checks, credit screens, criminal history, verify income. They're going to give us, I'm going to show, we're going to show you a picture of the report so you know what this does for you. Okay, this is how you get an application and a background check done on them. You go to mysmartmove.com and you create an application as a landlord. You send them the It'll all be digital. It'll go to their email and they'll have a choice to start the background screen and they'll have to put their credit card in to pay for it. Okay. It's like $42 or something. Now it's gone up a little. Send an application to every adult that's going to be moving into the property. All right. Review the tenant buyer results. It doesn't take very long to get these results. How long did you wait on this deal that we're going to share here, Lou, to get results from my smart move? Well, probably a day, maybe yeah. less. I can't remember. Yeah, it's, so. it's a few hours or a day, maybe. 
criminal background check, sex offender registry. You you'll you'll get some information. You you may want to call a previous landlord. Okay, you which would be rental history. You may want to call and verify they're employed to where they say they're employed. I, it's up to you. Okay, but I'm going to show you the report. You get's pretty thorough, but but these are all good ideas. Make sure everything's filled out on the application for every applicant. Okay, that's all taken care of for you with my smart move. All right, you'll kind of get an idea from the report if they could get a mortgage in one or two years, whatever the lease option term is. You'll get a report and I'm gonna show you, we're gonna show you what it looks like, okay? And so you'll be able to kind of know, oh, this person's so financially jacked up, they'll never be able to buy a house. Or you'll know, hey, this person's kind of jacked up, but not so bad that they probably couldn't pull it together. Okay, you'll, you'll get to see this, and we'll show you this here in just a few minutes. All right, now another thing here, make sure you save that information as much as you can so you have some kind of record of this deal, okay? So in other words, be organized a little bit. Be a professional and be organized. Create a folder in Google Drive or Dropbox or create an email folder or something where you can store things concerning this deal, all right? After that, you're going to send paperwork and collect the option fee. It's going to be wired, okay? Now, this pretty much wraps up for the most part. I'll let you finish reading the, the checklist. You, you probably already have. And here's a little bit of a, a, a go back and review. Here's the qualifying the tenant buyer questions. I have them here because I want you to create, my best advice is, is send yourself a text message or an email where you can copy and paste it because when and if you build an ad, you might have 50 people in the first week or two or maybe a few days even reach out to you. Do you really wanna ask all five of those questions Every single time. No, you don't. You just want to copy and paste the, those answers or those questions. Hey, do you really want to rent to own or just rent? Are you looking to rent to own or just rent? You know, is, is the payment comfortable? You know, here's the payment. Have you seen the property? How much do you have, you know, as a down payment for your new home? Would, are you willing to do a tenant screening? All of those things. Okay, so you probably want to send yourself a text message or an email or something where you can just copy and paste this because you will get so sick of writing it over and over and over. <laughs> because, you know, let's imagine 50 people reach out to you about your property and the first thing they say on Facebook inevitably every time is, is this still available? Well, do you really want to type this whole thing out? Well, do you really want to rent the own or, you know, blah, blah. No, you just copy and paste. Okay. Now, some of you are out there thinking, well, there's probably a way to get a bot to do this. Yeah, there probably is. All right, but this is this is the, the old school fashion of just getting it done, all right? So copy and paste your, your questions from some other app or something so you don't have to rewrite them, all right? So you'll find those questions, again, reiterated on page nine of that ebook. all right? And somebody please throw that ebook back into the chat for uh, Lee. He, he just popped in here. In fact, I'll do it. I think I got it right here, Lee, if you want to pick up this ebook. On page 10 is a script. So remember, after you've messaged the tenant buyer and pre-qualified them a little bit, you have to get on the phone with them and you have to have this conversation with them and confirm that they do make three times the amount of rent, that they do want to rent to own, that they have seen the property, that they are willing to submit to a background screen, that they are in possession of a substantial down payment. Okay, here is a script that will help you conversate with them on page 10. All right, if you're looking for a way, well, what if they ask me how this works? What do I say? Well, here's the answers, okay? Here's the answers. All right, so there's a little more detail for you there. Now let's go to page 12. This is the appointment confirmation memo. So again, if I'm showing the property to a tenant buyer and the homeowner is there, I definitely want to use this. If the homeowner is not there and there's a lockbox on the house, I'm definitely still want some of this information. 
okay? Maybe not all of it, but I want some of it. I want to know who they are. I want to know what time they're going to go. I want to know, I want to be able to let the, the seller know, okay, hey, somebody's coming to the property Tuesday at noon. Their names are Jack and Jim, and they're in love, and they want to buy this house. They're very excited about it, Mr. Homeowner. I'll let you know what the results are after they've seen the property. Now notice on this confirmation memo, it has this paragraph here that says, and I just highlighted it here, sharing screens. If you do send this, send this, if you do have the homeowner showing the property, send this for signatures and make sure the homeowner gets this, okay? He's gonna be the one that signs this, the homeowner here, okay? If he's showing the property for you and here in this paragraph, it says, that he has filled out an agreement with you and that he does, he is reaffirming now that he's not going to go around you and steal your tenant buyer. Okay. If your homeowner is unwilling to sign this, then you have to wonder, is he planning on screwing me? He won't sign my confirmation memo for having a point. He won't set an appointment with my tenant buyer in a way that confirms that we're still on the same page. Okay. Now between you and me, do I always, always, always use this? I always want to. In some cases, I trust the guy and I don't. All right. But in some cases, I really don't trust the guy and I want him to sign this before I send somebody over. You're acknowledging that I'm not just sending them over out of the goodness of my dumb old heart. I'm sending them over because we have an agreement and we're doing a deal here. You're not allowed to take them from me. Okay, that's what the purpose of this particular document is. All right, so let's get into the case study. But before we do that, there's probably some questions that I've already raised up. Are there any questions that need to be put to bed here really fast? Anything? Before we get into a hard case example. We've been going for about 45 minutes. We got another 45 minutes left in the 90 minutes and we're gonna make it full of case study examples. So you get to see real world experience here. Any questions so far? Hopefully I'm not boring you. Dispositions is kind of boring. <laughs> when the tenant buyer sees the house, do they put a down payment on it at the term, a deposit? Okay, so here's how this works in real life. That's a great question, William. And and why that's a great question is often often the start date today, like for example, is April 20th, uh 420-2024. Oftentimes, if I have a deal with a homeowner, like let's say the move in, he's not expecting anyone to move in if we have somebody at, at least until May 1st which would be five one. So that's like a whole week and a half away. In some cases, it might be June 1st, which is a whole five weeks away. Yeah, so the, the answer is, is if they like the property, they've seen the property, I will send them the application and, and, and we'll show you this in the case study. We'll send them the application on mysmartmove.com. We'll start the background screens and then we'll also ask them to put some money down when they might say, well, we're not moving in until June 1st. That's five weeks from now. I understand, but I cannot take this property off the market unless you've put down at least a deposit. Okay. You like in the, in the case study case, it would be, for example, you know, we've agreed to accept a $20,000 down payment from you we'll need you to at least make a deposit of $5,000 or something significant to take this off the market. And then you can pay the rest before you move in, of course, on June 1st, five weeks from now. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. You have to get money. Okay. If you don't get money, you don't get anything. All right. My point is, is if he's interested today on April 20th, move in can't happen until June 1st, five weeks from now. If you don't get a deposit now, he's going to be bombarded with a million thoughts and a hundred different other opportunities between now and June 1st 
and he has no financial commitment to you whatsoever, you will likely lose this tenant buyer. They will think themselves out of it over the next five weeks. So you have to get something, get a commitment with some money of, I don't care if it's $20, $100, $250, 500 Mr. Tenant Buyer, what do you have that you can place down as a deposit so that I can remove this property from the marketing? Because I want you to live there. You want to live there. We need to tie this deal down. You owe $20,000 in down payment. What can you put down now? In some cases, it's the full 20. In other cases, it's a couple thousand. Okay. But you definitely want, here's a verse, a proverb Jesus said in the New Testament. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you want their heart to be tied up in this property deal? Absolutely. Then you better get some treasure on it. Okay. And that's just wisdom. All right. You got to get some treasure. All right. Good question. Any other questions? I'm really glad you brought that one up, William. That's a big question. Okay, let's talk about the study, the case study. Let's jump right in. We have several different players involved. We have the homeowner. His name is Mr. Goswami. I'm going to call him in the case study. He's going to be Mr. Gossman. Okay. We have Rico, the wholesaler. He's the guy that got the deal under contract with the homeowner. He did a lease option agreement with the homeowner. And we're going to show you what that is here in a minute. The dispositions agent that worked here, not an agent, but a specialist, nevertheless, Lou, our hero of the day. And he's here in the room, and we're going we're gonna to let Lou interject here a lot here in this case study. He was tasked with the, the job of listing the property, working with the qualifying tenant buyer prospects, you know, finding the right one, getting the property shown, you know, all of, getting the paperwork signed, collecting the, the down payment deposit, all of that. There, there's a lot that goes into this, and Lou did a great job, and I'm going to show you that today. The tenant buyer ended up being the prospect that, that he worked with on this particular deal is Eric, the tenant buyer. That's what we're calling him here, Eric, the tenant buyer. Now, we'll find out that Eric has a friend later on in the story, and his name is Arthur. And Arthur is just the tenant buyer's friend and eventually partner in the deal, okay? So we'll show you how all this came together, and it'll make more sense. But these are the players, and, of course, Coach Justin down there smoking a cigar. Super player right there. Say what? That cigar. Yeah. It's nice. It was a good one, too. I enjoyed every every minute of it. Uh, here's the property deal. El Mirage, California. Our wholesaler, Rico, you got to remember the name. Rico, the wholesaler, put this property under contract for 24 months, lease option, at $250,000. Now, notice the Zestimate was two forty three. dollars and I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about some some details here in a minute about this that's important to recognize. But the estimate's two forty three, and he put it under contract for two fifty. Is that a problem? Not at all. Very very close. Can we add money to this and sell it within two years? Likely, no problem whatsoever. Okay, remember in a lease option, we are creating profit spread based on future appreciation speculatively. Okay. All right. Now, monthly rent, $1,600 a month. The Zestimate for the rent was $1,720. So that works out real nice. Real, real nice. Okay. You have problems when you contract deals that are worth $250 and you contract them at $290. That's a problem. Okay. When the monthly rent, should be 1720 and you contracted at 2400 a month. That's a problem. Okay. These are why these are why property deals don't have any tenant buyers. There's always a reason why I mean, if you think about it, right now in the United States there's such a high demand for housing. If your house is sitting there and nobody wants it, there's a reason why. 
And it's probably not poltergeist. It's probably something much more simple than this. It's probably just the fact that you're asking $290,000 for a $250,000 house. Or you're asking for $2,400 a month rent for something that really everybody knows you could rent for $1,600. Okay, so you got to keep the metrics, you know, somewhat sensical here. Otherwise, your deal's just going to sit there. And I know that's that's like, well, that's that's an acquisitions problem. Yes, it is. It is an acquisitions problem. And I have tons of students that come in and they contract deals because I teach them to give give the seller pretty much everything they want, but within reason, okay? I mean, you can't give them everything they want, like without reason, but you can give them full market value or maybe even slightly above. See, look, 243 is his estimate and, and he, was, he gave him 250. Rico did a great job. The rent is estimate seventeen hundred. He gave him sixteen hundred. Great job. Now we now we have potential here. But here's where here's where I started questioning the deal. The seller wants twelve thousand five hundred dollars down. You know how much that is? That's five. That's five percent. Seller wants five percent down. That's a little steep. I like to contract my deals somewhere between two and three percent down. All right. So uh, I had questions whether or not we would be able to find a tenant buyer that has 12,500 down for the seller plus another 10 grand profit for us. Cuz remember we were asking 22,500 for this particular deal down. We had a guy that eventually came to us with 20,000 down. Okay, so we'll get further into the case study, but you can see where my concerns were is that man, we got to raise a bunch of money here out of somebody before we can start making our first dollar. Okay, the contract date, this is very important. Rico contracted the homeowner on January 11th this year. He contracted it for 30 days. That means it expired on February 11th. If he were to be successful and produce a tenant buyer, the move-in date wasn't until March 1st, okay? I know it's a lot to try to track mentally, but if you can remember these dates, there was only 30 days to succeed. And if we succeeded, it would be another 30 days before the guy could move in, basically. Okay, here's pictures of the property. Look at this. It looks like some kind of industrial park almost. Here's the house. Pretty ugly. The inside looks like it's okay, though. I mean, it's it looks livable, but just not very nice. Okay, not very nice, but livable. Why would we contract this deal? You guys have heard me say this a thousand times. Pretty houses. I'm a pretty house wholesaler. I do pretty houses. All right, this deal is a little different though. This deal here is not that pretty. But I'm also telling folks, and hopefully you've heard me say this, that we are kind of in the affordable housing business. In the rent to own business, it's kind of affordable housing. We are creating opportunities for people who can't qualify through conventional methods of buying a home. These are affordable properties most of the time. So when I saw this property, I thought, ooh, ugly. But if somebody comes in in 24 months, does a little bit of work to this property cosmetically, they might have something really nice. It's livable. It has electricity. It has plumbing. It has a roof. It has a foundation. It, it needs cosmetics really bad. Well, the guy that we find, the guy that, that Lou found on Facebook Marketplace, by the way, and we'll show you the ad and everything here in a minute, that guy was willing to put in some elbow grease, some, some sweat equity, improve the cosmetics of the house over 24 months. He knew that it was all part of the deal, all part of the deal, okay? So this property, just because it's not that pretty, doesn't disqualify it. In fact, it worked out quite well because it's affordable housing. Where else can you buy a house, potentially here, with only $20,000 down, <laughs> all right, and move in and start changing it to fit you just right now, paint it the color you want to paint it, put the flooring in you want to put it, dress the windows the way you want to dress them, the whole nine yards. Okay, that's the potential offer here. And fortunately, Lou was able to find somebody that really, really wanted that. Now, you'll see on page 18, here is the actual assignment agreement that Rico used.
okay? And you can see it's the same one that I give away to the club members here, okay? And it's all filled out, and there's signatures here at the bottom, all right? So you can see $250,000 is the cost, $12,500 down to the seller, which is 5%. All right, so that's the agreement Rico used to contract the deal with the homeowner. Now, here's what Lou did immediately. After, after reviewing the numbers and marking the property up 10000 so we could make a profit, building the Facebook marketplace listing, is the marketplace listing is found on page 24. You can see it's very, very wordy. It's very wordy. It's, it's, like, it's like Zillow wrote this, or it's like... It's like chat GPT wrote it. <laughs> Tell us, how did you get the description, Lou? How did you put this Facebook listing together? You decided that if we contracted it at 250, we need to at least have the listing, the marketplace listing at 260 so we could create 10,000 for ourselves. Uh, $1,600 a month rent, that was easy. So what went into the building of this ad, Lou? Well, at first, I I, uh, I just uh, was in the high desert because I'm from California. And so I, I drafted my little thing, uh, my own little ad. And I said, you know, it's, it doesn't sound appealing. So I went to chat GPT and asked chat GPT to make it sound appealing for someone who might want to fix up the property. Mm. And this is what it kicked out. So I said, well, this is really nice. So I posted that from the stand. Yeah. <laughs> Attention handyman enthusiast. Okay. Yeah, great. It's a great, it's a great thing. And then you, and you use chat GPT to create this. Is that what you said? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> great. It's super good. Sprawling across approximately 422,000 square feet of land. I, I don't even know if that's so incalculable in my mind. I don't even know what that means. But look, it's got all the key ingredients here, 260000 1600 a month, reasonable down payment required, okay, 24 months, handyman special. Yeah, good job, Lou. Looks really good. This is what a Facebook marketplace listing looks like. Now, the only critique I would have is I would have tried to have gotten the front of the, pic the, front of the house maybe as this main photo. But you could see it didn't even really matter in the end because Lou did a great job and found somebody. So, but but that's the only critique I would have about this. Um, it it looks really nice. Okay, let's go to the next page. When the tenant buyers start messaging you about your ad, and you can see here's what it looks like. Eric, remember our tenant buyer. Our tenant buyer Eric messaged Lou and said, "Hey, look." Uh, Hey boss, interested in making a cash type of deal with me? I got 10k down and can pay cash monthly or direct deposit of around 1600 to 2000 a month and maybe around I don't know what 130 months means but I you know you it's a goofy message and it sounds like he doesn't have the down payment and everything but watch what happens here. Lou says so here's what's up if you're going to lease this lease option, this property, the property price is 260. We will need at least 20,000 down. The monthly is 1600 a month for 24 months or earlier. If you're going to buy it all cash, what are you offering? Okay. He says, okay, I think I can make that happen. When can I see the house? <laughs> okay. Now, Lou says the address is this. Drive by and see if you're interested. What a stroke of professional genius. Okay, because you definitely would not want to set up an actual showing with this guy yet because you don't really, he sounds flaky still. So Lou did the best thing and said, well, hey, just drive by the house. Make sure you want it before we start getting into any heavy details of negotiating anything. Now that you know what the score is, we're going to need at least 20000 down. It's $260,000 in 24 months. 
drive by the house and make sure it's something you want. Eric said, I'm interested to see the inside. And then Lou had the balls. And I'm going to just say it like that because it takes balls. Lou said, Eric, the 20000 down is an option consideration and not refundable. Are you sure you are able to do that? Do you have the 20000 available today? Do you see what he's doing? He's doing exactly what I was teaching you earlier. He's making sure that this guy is not a tire kicker or a waste of time. If he doesn't have the money, then he doesn't get to see the house. All right? <laughs> not refundable, he says. Eric says, not refundable as if I choose not to buy or even if I want to buy after 24 months. That 20 k won't be counted for the purchase price. Okay. I'm interested in buying, blah, blah. I have 20, but I just, I have the 20, but I just want to see the property and want to talk more in detail on how I can start the purchase after the two years or during. Okay. He's eating out of Lou's hand here. He's chasing Lou now a little. You, you, you see how the momentum of the ball game has shifted. Okay. He said, I got 10. Now he's like, oh, I have the 20. I just want to make sure it's something that I want to do. And then he says, Lou says, give me a time when you plan on going by so I can set this up with the owner. Eric says, yes, I also live close by. There's no tenants living there, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I'm the one making the final decision on the purchase, but I'm just making sure there are some things are, that are good on the property and paperwork and fines are cleared from the grow that was in the back. It must have had some weeds, but yes, I'm and still willing to buy. Okay. Now, Lou, big balls, Lou. I love that, man. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me calling that, calling you that. But this is just incredible. If you put in the 20K option, he's, Lou says to the tenant buyer prospect, if you put in the 20K option consideration, the purchase price drops by that amount. The rent does not drop the price. Do you understand where he's coming from with that? So, yes, any money you put down, Eric, is going to come off the purchase price when you buy but the rent does not come off the purchase price. After 24 months, you typically notify the seller that you're buying the property. We can talk more about this later. Did you drive by the property? There are no, there are tenants, so we will need to give them notice that someone will come by, okay? Eric, will you be making the final decision on this purchase? You see, he's not taking any shit off anybody. Lou has the attitude. Qualifying. Yes. Really good qualifying. Yes. Super great job qualifying. Now, it's more like, hey, if you want to see this property, Eric, you're going to have to show me the money. It's kind of that attitude. And that's the same attitude you got to have. Okay. Now, that way you don't waste your time and your energy with people who can't do the deal. Now the con conversation continues. When Lou says, "When do you want to see the inside?" He's Eric says, "I'm available tomorrow. What time? Earlier the better. 9 a.m. Let me see if that works." So now Lou has to set up something because the homeowner was going to show the property. The homeowner had a, a brother or a neighbor or somebody nearby that was showing the property. That's just how he insisted on doing it. Okay. The results are that er that Eric the tenant buyer saw the inside of the house and he liked it enough to want to move forward, including putting down twenty thousand bucks. Now he didn't put down twenty thousand dollars that day. We're going to show you what happened, but he did eventually put down twenty thousand plus the first month's rent. Okay, that was the result of this great pre qualifying. If you don't pre qualify, then you don't get great results like this. You get crap results. You get crappy people that waste your time and make you want to quit the business. All right, so let's begin with where we left off. The tenant buyer saw the property. He liked it, and he wanted to move forward. So Lou sent him an application on mysmartmove.com, and a day later, this is what Lou got. And I've shown this before uh, on other deals in, my, in some other videos, but it, it always looks the same. Okay, just different different people. Now, it's kind of a little bit hard to read here, but you can see the important parts is it says that the background checks and everything have been completed. 
you see where it says here at the top name eric status and alerts completed and then at the top it says recommendation and it says reports and then it says resident score and action right across the top there okay you can see the recommendation it says that transunion recommends that we accept this guy and the reason why is because while he has some dings on his credit it's not that bad and you can see down here employment and income verification it says that transunion suggests that he makes about sixty five hundred dollars a month plus an additional thousand from somewhere so now we have math to do and i know mathing is hard but the you remember the rent is 1600 a month how much would three times that amount be somebody tell me forty eight hundred dollars lee says in the chat if he's making sixty five hundred plus a thousand does he have the income to support the deal at sixteen hundred a month thumbs up yes does transunion say yes you should accept him because his credit sucks but it's not that bad yes that too so far so good okay so far so good now let me show you what they also provide at this time they provide in reports there's a credit report you could view you could look at eric's credit report you could look at eric's criminal re history report you could look at eric's eviction history report and you could look at details regarding eric's income these are reports that are additional reports available. If you click these blue buttons, they open up reports that you can look at. But my biggest concern is, is whether it says accept or reject. Okay. And this accept or reject is automatically produced by TransUnion because it's grading him based on his income, based on whether he's been evicted recently, based on whether or not he's a, a sex predator, based on the fact that his credit is is what it is they are going to say accept this guy he can support this deal now if it says reject and you go ahead and accept then i guess you do you you do what you do and you get what you get and then you don't throw a fit right that's what mom used to say and this is applicable here if it says reject don't accept <laughs> this is a bad deal don't take this person but i need the money justin and they got some money don't do it don't sell out don't sell out okay wait for the better guy there's somebody else coming along just be patient all right so the conversation between lou and i begins so lou immediately notices Remember, we contracted, Rico contracted this deal on January 11th. Today, in the story, he gets back my smart move. It's already February 15th, and this contract that started with the homeowner by Rico on January 11th was for 30 days. It expired on February 11th. Oops, our agreement with the seller is already expired. What do you do? It's a good question. What do you do? So what I said was, is I said, Hey, uh, Hey Lou, would you, uh, would you like to call this seller and see if you can get this deal extended a little while because we got somebody good on the line and see if he's willing to do the deal. Tell us what happened, Lou. I'll, I'll let you guys read the text word for word later, but tell us what happened when you called Mr. Gosman. And you said, hey, listen, this is expired, and uh, we we got somebody we think is real solid. We want to do this, so can we get an extension? What did he tell you? Or how did you ask him? Oh, my gosh. Um, I had I had just, just asked him, you know, when I called him, he didn't know who, it, who I was. And so I told him I was working with uh, Enrico, and he told me that he didn't hear from him. Um, I, so I, had, I said, well, um, he, you know, you can talk to me. Uh, he says, I haven't heard from him. I texted him and, um, yeah. and then, uh, went into, uh, I said, you know, it's expired. I, I need, I need to extend it. He says, I don't want to extend it. 
why do I need to extend it? You know, uh, you know, we're set for uh, March uh, March first. Mm. And I go well, and so I think I went back to Justin and said, "Hey, it doesn't want to extend it." <clears throat> yeah, I said. A couple things here. Um, when Lou called the homeowner, the homeowner was pissed. The reason why he's pissed is because he hasn't heard from the original wholesaler. Not in a substantial way that he felt like he should have, at least. Okay, and I'm not throwing any rocks here at Rico, but here's the point. It's easy to contract a deal and forget about it, especially when you have a dispo partner. Do not make that mistake. As an acquisitions person, if you're not keeping in touch with the homeowner at least once a week or so to let them know what's happening, then they get pissed. Just like a person does when they contract their house to be listed on the MLS with a realtor and they never hear from the realtor again. Same thing. So Rico could have done a little better job of following up. That's all. N not a big deal. Could have could have followed up a little bit. When Lou called and said, hey, our contract's expired. The move-in date is March 1st, but it expired on February, February 11th because we haven't assigned this to anyone. The homeowner said, well, I'm pissed, but, you know, I like you, Lou, and I'll talk to you. And, and in fact, you know, why do we even need an extension? Because, you know, you guys aren't supposed to even have anybody move in until March 1st. If you got somebody, great. So what he gave us really was a verbal extension. Okay. I didn't get a contract extension, but I got a verbal extension. And for me, a verbal extension, when I got somebody on the line with a $20,000 down payment, yeah, I'm good. I'm good to go with that. Okay. Because I'm going to get out yeah. official paperwork here before long, and that'll that'll tie up everything anyway. What were you saying, Lou? I was going to say that um, I had noticed on the document when I when I was talking with uh, Mr. Goswami that it said March 11. <clears throat> March 11 was the moving date. So when oh, okay. Him, but but he was he didn't like that. He says it was supposed to be March 1st. I said, and why does it say March 11? So he was already pissed. <laughs> so. And it was March 11th because, uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not uh, or not uh, saying anything bad about Rico. He just said he marked it, uh, I think it was 30 days or 60 days from January 11th, right? So he went to March 11th. <clears throat> that's not yeah. that's what yeah. You know, it's a great point Lou's bringing up because the dates and everything, this is this is the, the part of making the marriage, okay? You're making a marriage between the tenant buyer and your homeowner. And the dates don't work, and this is off, or whatever it is, that's your job. That's what you get paid for, is to make it work somehow. To call the seller and say, hey, listen, if I have somebody, can we still do this, even though our contract expired a few days ago? Oh, well, it, it, it expired? I, He didn't even know. Okay, no one's even contacted him. He's feeling kind of pissed about it. Okay, well, great. Calm down, Mr. Homeowner. We've got somebody. I've got great news, and we, we want to move forward. Let's change it to March 1st. That makes you happy. Great. I'm going to call Eric and see if March 1st is a great date for him. Eric, the tenant buyer. You're making a marriage work. So Lou did a great job there. So after that, um, Lou on page, uh, let's see, page 32, Lou starts paperwork. Lou starts the paperwork with the homeowner. And it's really two pieces of paper, okay? Two pieces of paper. And I've included those in the ebook here with links, okay? So you can pull these up and have these forever. But one is the assignment addendum. And you can see it's pretty much a one page deal here. And the second piece of paper that Lou needed was this tenant buyer disclosure. Statement of understanding is what it's called. Now, this is your cover your ass letter, all right? Besides those two documents, you don't really need anything to do this deal, which is why I love this business. I don't need a an attorney. I don't need a title company. All I need is an assignment addendum and my cover your ass letter. Now, Lou went to the, to the task of getting the tenant buyer to sign the assignment addendum because he's passed the mysmartmove.com screening and everything. Lou called the homeowner and said, hey, this guy's looking pretty good. We want to go ahead and lock him in and move forward. Lou probably had to send the uh, the homeowner something, though. 
What did you have to send the homeowner in order to get the homeowner to agree with you to move forward with this guy, Eric? How did you talk the homeowner into being cool with this new guy, Eric? I didn't really have to. I mean, it was just, uh, I just, I just told them that we have some guy um, and uh, he's really interested in picking it up. Um, he, he, just to say, okay, let's try to get him in. That's really what it was. I don't remember what, what did I, what did I tell you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You told me that you had to send the guy uh -huh. this picture that I just showed you guys from my smart move. So when oh, yeah. you talk to the homeowner, you're like, Hey, I got this guy, Eric TransUnion says he's good. You can see it says, accept him here. We've run the full battery of checks on him. You sent him this screenshot. I did, yeah. This is what I routinely do as well. Okay. I'll send the homeowner this screenshot. No, I don't send him the credit report. No, I don't send him the history of criminal activity report or the eviction history. None of those things are that important once we have this screenshot. Okay. So I send the screenshot. Plus this is none of everybody's business in my opinion, but I, you know, I can't share these things with everybody in the whole world because these are private stuff about Eric. So I can share you share with you this screen where TransUnion has definitely okay, most of the time that's enough. And in this particular case, that was enough to make the homeowner feel comfortable enough to move forward with Eric. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and skip down to page, if you're following along at all in the ebook, it's page 37. Uh -huh. Because really to tie up this lease option deal with the tenant buyer, it only requires those two documents, the assignment addendum, the cover your ass letter, the statement of understanding, and then, it, and then we gotta get some money down. We gotta get some money down. This is, in the story here, it's February 15th, February 16th, move-in date is not until March 1st, but we need to get the paperwork signed now, and we need to get some kind of deposit if we can now. Okay. So you'll find here the story moves on. It's pretty humorous. The banks are closed on the weekend. It was already Friday. We couldn't get any money, and we still needed signatures and the whole nine yards. So Lou has the task now of following up with the guy next week. Unfortunately, the story takes a massive turn. On page 38, there are squatters that invade the home during our deal. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's like to have a deal almost put together and now there's these, these damn squatters? <laughs> Not only that, but I'll leave you to read the rest of the story. Um, Lou's trying to get signatures here, but the squatters have ripped out the wiring and some copper or whatever it is out of the house. They're stripping the house down as we speak. All seems lost. <laughs> Boy, I was I remember the day this happened, Lou, and I looked I I looked up to heaven and I said, Lord, why why now? Why this? <laughs> why is this happening, Lord? <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you it all works out in the end, but there's some really good information here about how to handle uh, at least a good story about how to handle squatters in this particular case. It did work out. You can read eventually the cops were called. They had the house surrounded. There was guns out the whole nine yards. Okay. It got ugly, but you can see over here on page 40, he got signatures. Lou got signatures. Well, he got the, he so far, not all signatures, but he's starting to get signatures anyway. And you know, that's what I can say about a lot of things. Sometimes the way you see it, the deal is sunk. 
But that's your job, is to unsink it. <laughs> All right, if you can, and not, not always can you. But in this far out outlandish example, where squatters invade the house and start stripping it of everything in the middle, of, we're almost the closing for crying out loud. Sometimes the best thing to do is to just set your face to continue on and overcome whatever obstacles there may be, if possible. Okay. Otherwise, what are, what are the options? Throw up your hands and give up? Yeah, well, that's the option. Lose out, spend all this time and effort, and get nothing. All right, so you can continue reading the story, and you can see how Lou deals with the squatters and so on and so forth. And then on page uh, 42... <clears throat> you'll see here that my job as a coach is to expose opportunities, expose you to opportunities. Okay. I want you to learn as a coach. I want you to have opportunities and yeah, you're going to have some crazy shit happen. Sometimes crazy shit happens, especially on your first deal or two. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe it's the universe testing you. I'm not sure. But some crazy stuff happens. Now, Lou says, I'm praying and trusting God to lead me through. Yeah, exactly. He said, I got the statement of understanding. So I got the tenant buyer. He signed. The tenant buyer is still willing to sign. Okay. Why would the tenant buyer still be willing to sign? After all of this. Tell us what happened, Lou. Can you just give us the story? Tell us how this worked out, man. Well, you know, he really wanted the property, and he when he the following day after uh, the cops were called, he went back to take take a look at the uh, property and make sure that uh, dude. Everything... I was praying. I was scared. I was nervous. I was like, "Oh, what will he find over there? Oh, it must be bad. It must be so bad." Yeah. So he said that if it's really bad, that he just he didn't want the property anymore. So I was like, "Oh." So he took a look at it. And he came back and he said. Yeah, it, it's all right. It, it's nothing that he can't handle. So he wanted to go ahead and move forward. Really. And the reason partly is because this guy's a handyman. Remember, the whole ad to begin with was a handyman looking for a handyman. Yeah. So yeah. what what he found after the cops got rid of the squatters was that the house had some damage, but he could handle it. Not a big deal for this guy. So the deal is moving forward. Man, what a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing. Right? Like, this is the most far out shit anybody's ever heard of, man. Cops and guns and squatters and house getting stripped and everything right, right before closing. And yet somehow this guy was still okay with it. So Lou gets the whole paperwork done um, with the homeowner, with the, the tenant buyer. And now we need to get wire transfers. Now, I'll say one more thing about the, the whole getting signatures thing. And that is, is if you're new to this business and you haven't used your DocuSign program before, whatever it is, HelloSign, DocuSign, PDF Sign, Adobe, whatever it is, I use DotLoop, okay? Um, whatever it is you're using, try it on yourself first and make sure that you understand what your client's experience will be. All right, because if you don't, then you don't really know what's happening. All right, and you want to know how it works for them so that you can instruct your tenant buyer and your seller on how to sign these documents. Oh, you're going to get it in an email, and it's going to look like this, and you're going to click a button, and it's going to open up, and then you can read the contract, and at the bottom, you click the thing, and you sign it electronically, okay? I've done it once, so I know how it works. All right, so that's an important thing um, that's – Great for new people to do. Practice it. Okay, don't just go with the cheapest DocuSign thing out there because those suck. Okay, and they make everybody sign up for a free account before they can even read your contract, and nobody wants to do that. Okay, so you got to use quality signature programs that you have some experience personally with, even if it's just you testing it yourself. Okay, so... He gets signatures and lots of promises about the wire transfer coming. Remember, this is about February 15th. Move-in day is March 1st. 
and we are now only waiting on wire transfers. Lou, tell us how the wire transfers went. Well, so Eric had his friend Arthur, who was actually going to give the down payment, about twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, enter Arthur. Yeah, enter Arthur now, the tenant buyer's friend. Right. right. And, and boss, just so you know. This is oh, boss. and boss. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. And boss. Yeah. Uh, I so he so Arthur said that he he wanted to get all the paperwork. And re review it before he sends money. And so it kind of confused me. I had to call Eric. I said, well, I thought you had the money. as well, it's Eric. It's Arthur who's going to help him buy the property. So I had to deal with Arthur now. And so Arthur said, yeah, um, I need the paperwork. I asked Justin if I needed some paperwork. He said, yeah. Okay, so we did that. And Arthur then wanted to be on the documents. So <laughs> okay. Are you following this? So... So he's trying to get Eric and the seller to sign the, the the paperwork here to tie this all up, and now all of a sudden we've got this Arthur character that 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 Eric, the tenant buyer, works for that's actually providing the money, and he wants to see the paperwork too, and he wants to even be on the paperwork now. So what do we do? We we added him, didn't we, Lou? We certainly did, and it was uh, like pulling teeth trying to get him to sign. And then when I finally got him to sign, for some reason, uh, Eric's signature disappeared. <laughs> so I had, and it was like it was uh, juggling. I mean, it was that you know, uh, and the timing because it took like a week or two weeks for Arthur to sign. And when I finally got him to sign, I lose Eric's signature, and it was like really frustrating. So I had to get back to Eric to have him sign. It was another two or three days. It was, uh, so yeah. So, so remember, this is kind of a, a far out outlandish type deal. It, this is this example has everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I'm showing yeah. it to you, because your deals will be much easier than this. Okay? <laughs> but after adding this new character, Arthur, the tenant buyer's friend and boss and funder now, the guy with the 20,000 down, after adding him, it was kind of a again, it was kind of a we already had Eric's signature. Now we have to add this new guy, Arthur. And when we added Arthur, we had to start over and get everybody's signatures again. That's part of the e-sign program. So what Lou's talking about is he had to follow up with Eric. He had to follow up with the seller and get signatures again. And he had to follow up with Arthur to get him to finally sign. Because remember, Arthur's the guy with the money. So he followed up. And he followed up and he followed up. What was the follow-up? How did you word the follow-up? What were some of the things you were saying to them to get them to sign? You know, I was just telling them that, you know, because we have a new signature, someone who needs to sign, we need to re-sign, have everybody re-sign the documents. That's all I was telling them. Um, I also had to get Rico to re-sign. Yeah, you also had to get the wholesaler guy to yeah, because remember yeah. we have a, a wholesaler that contracted this deal. We're we're working dispositions for him, so yeah, so yeah, so, so everybody had is, to sign. I think it was like, I think we had him. I had him sign almost like three times. He was getting pretty frustrated. Yeah, um, I, he was he was actually asking me to see if I can find another buyer because, uh, you know, he knew the contract was expired. Yeah. Um, so followed up he followed up lou followed up followed up followed up got got all the signatures from everybody again now we're waiting on arthur the funder guy to sign lou gets lou finally says hey listen we need you to sign this it's all documented right here in the ebook i, I encourage you to just spend 10 minutes and read the rest of this story but he got them to follow. He followed up. He got Arthur to sign. Now what remains is, is all we need is for the guy to send the money. He needs to wire $12,500 down payment to the seller. And he needs to wire $7,500 to our wholesaler partner, Rico. Okay, that's how the money is being divided here. 
Remember, because we got, we didn't take a twenty-two thousand five hundred dollar down payment, we took a twenty thousand dollar down payment. We still owe the seller twelve thousand five hundred, so that leaves a spread of seventy five hundred for for the disposition side over here for this for us over here this the wholesaler. Okay, so what happens is, and there's a lot of details in this story that I'm I'm leaving out, so read it, but. The seller got the twelve thousand five hundred. Did you get the seventy five hundred, Lou? No, didn't get it right away. He was so Arthur wanted to make sure that he was sending money to the right place. So what he did actually for the both the seller uh, and us was send one dollar to make sure that he received it. It was ten dollars. Yeah, he sent ten dollars. Ten dollars or something. Yeah. As a test. Yeah. So, ten dollars came, and it was like, okay, and that was at the weekend. Uh, and then so we had the we we we, we got the ten dollars. Uh, it was uh, the seller got his ten dollars. So uh, so I had to let uh, Arthur know. So he sent the rest of the money. <clears throat> and it came on Monday. So it was a Friday when he sent the $10. He got the rest of the money on Monday. But Rico didn't get his money. His $10. Right. So uh first for some so for some reason. He says, Oh, you know, I, I, I thought I sent it. I'm gonna resend it again. So he sent his ten dollars. But by the time I got a hold of Arthur, it was the following weekend. So there was this whole week. That went by. Yeah. There was a whole week of <clears throat> jacking around, looking for money that was supposedly sent, that wasn't sent, and then a test of $10, and then blah, blah, blah. Where is the damn money? That's yeah. what Lou wants to know. So yeah. read the story. Lou goes to battle for the money because it hasn't arrived yet, and move-in date is actually already here. Yeah. It's March 1st now, and we need to get the money, or this deal can't go through. So there's a story about what to do when the – in the story, I this example shows you what to do when the tenant buyer is playing around with sending you the money. What do you say? How do you handle this? Okay, all of that is written in the story. I'll let you read it. Long story short. He got the money. Lou got the money. Okay. He he finally accomplished. Rico received the money in his account and then paid paid us out the way he should. So all went to plan effectively. And have you heard from any of these people since, Lou? No. Not a word from the seller, not a word from the tenant buyer. But the tenant buyer moved in. He's been paying rent and everybody's been happy. Okay, so and you can see there's proof here in the actual ebook of the actual wire transfers as they went through and everything. The long story short here on money is is when a guy sends you money and he sends you a wire transfer, the bank always creates a transaction receipt for this. Have the guy when he sends you the money and the seller produce the receipts. That's it. Otherwise, yeah. you just have a hope and a prayer and a promise. Yeah. So when somebody's wiring you money, great. Thanks for wiring me that money today. Send me a copy of the receipt, and that'll be great. That's what Lou did. Now, Lou got copies of the receipts for the homeowner getting the 12500 and he got a receipt for the 7500 for the wholesaler. Now, once you have receipts, you kind of know the money's coming. Okay. Usually yeah. a wire transfer over the weekend doesn't go out, but it'll be here on Monday or it'll be here within a few hours or it'll be here by the morning. You know, it's short time before the money hits the bank when you have a bank receipt. So Lou did all that. All of that is documented in the story. Long story short, it was a very successful transaction with a lot of problems. Okay. This one had a lot of problems and there's a lot more problems that's detailed in the actual story. Read the story, but I don't want to labor you too, too much with that. Um, I've already talked way too long today. So let's go ahead and open up the, 
the room here and take questions about things that maybe were brought up, things I wasn't clear about, maybe things that I didn't mention. Some of them may be included in the ebook, some of them may not, but I want to answer any questions you have about dispositions. Does has this helped at all in understanding how you take a deal and sell it to a tenant buyer? Has this helped? Do you have questions? You know, one of the things that uh, you really need to pay attention to is who's actually the owner. So you, uh, in this case, it was uh, showed a, guy, a girl named Anita Goswami, but I was dealing with a guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, Justin told me it was a guy named Robbie, R-A-B-I. Robbie, yeah. R-A-B-I is the, the name of the homeowner on PropStream. Now this right. is all documented in the story in the ebook. You can read it too, but yeah. yeah, I, I, I screwed up. I overlooked that. I saw Goswami and I said, Oh, it's good. Actually Lou caught this late in the game that we were talking to the owner that wasn't really even the owner. Okay. How crazy is that? This is all documented in the ebook. Turns out it worked out though. Lou, how did that work out? And this is in the ebook too, but how did that work out? <clears throat> well, um, Turns out he told me that uh, Anita and Robbie is his uh, niece and nephew, but his name was not on, mm -hmm. on, on the title showing on prop stream. And he insisted it was, and he was going to send me uh, copies of the title. Yeah. So uh, again, this is the weekend when this all happens. And so it was, uh, he couldn't send it to me right away because he needed to get all the information. I had to wait till Monday when I called, uh, I called the title company up there just to find out. And um, actually, I was trying to see how much it was going to cost me to get information. And she said, Oh, I'll just tell you. And so I, I, I said, Look, the person I'm trying, trying to create a contract, and uh, the guy says his name is Subal, his name is Subal uh, Goswami. And um, is he on the title? And she says, Yes, he's on the title. So there you I go. She sent me the documentation, and I said, I was fine. So, so Lou got documentation that there'd been a grant deed performed and that Robbie Goswami was added to the title. Okay. No, Subal. Subal oh, I'm sorry. Added. Subal was, which is the same That's guy it. we're talking to. Is that correct? Well, correct. Yeah. Okay. And there's documentation of that conversation and an amendment that had to be created. <laughs> okay. All right there in that ebook. All right. So again, this is an outlandish, far out, problematic, uh, problematic story. But what I hope is that you'll read through this ebook and get a good sense of the of the worst deal imaginable. Okay. This is a relatively small deal, too. But I can tell you my experience has been that on a deal where you make twenty five thousand instead of seventy five hundred you have fewer problems. <laughs> okay. The, like the bigger, the, the, the deal, the less problems usually is the case. Okay. This deal was so screwed up from every which direction, every which way. And yet still Lou was able to solve problems. Now you've heard other people say this, and I'm going to remind you that the coaches and gurus and stuff are right. When they say, listen, you are a problem solver. That's what you get paid to do in this business. Now, if Lou had thrown up his hands with the with the whole ownership question, if he'd have thrown up his hands and given up with the squatters, with the stripping of the thing, with the cops being called, and with everything that went wrong in this deal, no one would have ever made any money. But because he didn't give up, he forged ahead, he was able to succeed. Now, the next deal that Lou does, he's more than adequately prepared for. Okay, and I hope that that will be your story, too, for participating in this class and being made aware of this story in detail. You'll be more than prepared to handle any major things that happen in your tenant buyer uh, working business, finding tenant buyers and placing them in your lease options homes. You'll be able to handle any situation that comes your way, and you'll find that most deals that you do have something in them that needs to be solved but not all of these things. Okay. So my attempt here today is not to scare you, but rather to encourage you that even in the ugliest of deals, there's hope. 
all right? But most deals are so much easier, okay? If I had to do this every single time on every deal, everything that Lou had to do, I'd give up, okay? I would. I'd be just like you, and I'd want to quit, okay? <laughs> if you read this today and you're like, oh, man, I don't want to do all this. Yeah, I would be the same way. But I know that most deals don't have all of these things wrong with them. Just something, one, maybe maybe two things that come up. Oh, you, you, you put those in the bed and you got a deal, okay? The dates, for example, the dates, the extension, the something, but then you have a deal. In this case, it was everything. But in most cases, it's just one thing, or it's the dates, or it's a signature, or it's getting a wire, or it's getting a receipt, or it's getting something. Usually, that's all. But in this case, and that's why I wanted to show and highlight this particular case, because it's so horrible. <laughs> it's so horrible, but yet Lou did such a great job, okay? So... Are there any questions about what I'll let you read the ebook and finish the story because there's quite a bit that goes on that we did not talk about today, but there's there's the nutshell of it all in an hour and a half. All right. So what questions might you have? I don't want you to leave here today and say, well, I still don't really understand how this works or how did that work or how do you what do you do or what do you say or OK, are there any questions about this disposition stuff? Because this is where your money's made, right? You feel like you've accomplished something when you get a house under contract, but great, you're only halfway. You got to now find somebody, solve the problems, make the marriage, and get paid. Okay. It is possible. It is doable. And most of the time, it's not this complicated. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody? I say good job, Lou, on the follow up and great class today to show you what could actually happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you saying that and and lou you did a great job man you did a great job and great job rico too for contracting this deal all right um the next thing now is just to go and do likewise really to let to to get rid of the fear that you have maybe the anxiety of how this works or what you know and realize that you are in control of a, a asset. In this case, Lou was in control of a quarter of a million dollars worth of assets. This is a $250,000 house. And Lou did a great job pre-qualifying the tenant buyer, getting the paperwork signed, those two pieces of paper, getting the right signatures for everybody, getting wire transfers and staying on top of it until it was done. Okay, that's what it takes. And that's all it takes. All right. It's helpful to have a good coach or a good partner that can help you answer some questions when you hit a snag. But most of the time, not quite this complicated. All right. Has anybody done a deal outside of this deal here today um, that done one and got paid? Anybody done one and got paid? Well, when you do want to get paid, you're going to come back to me and say, hey, listen, I got paid on this deal. And you're right. It sucked in a sense that I had to solve this problem and this problem, but it wasn't like I had squatters stripping the house and cops with guns and all of that. <laughs> okay. I didn't have to have five amendments or have signatures signed three different times. I, I didn't have to do, you're right, Justin. It, I am a problem solver, but I'm capable of doing it. I'm able to do it. And that's my job. And that's why when you're good at this, you can make thousands of dollars, boom, out of thin air. All right. That's the beauty of it all. But to the, to the winner goes the spoils, they say. Lou, in this case, is a winner. So Lou got paid some money on this deal. I made a little money on this deal as coach. Rico made a pretty good check. Pretty good check, too. So I encourage you. Thanks for being here at this class today. We're going to wrap up now. I'll take any questions you have, but I want to encourage you to get out there and get involved in the mess because the mess is where the money is. Okay. If Lou hadn't called the seller initially to work out this extension problem in the very beginning, and built a bridge with the seller, no one would have made any money and this story would not exist. But you have the ability to do it. Lou, you told me a story, and well, let's end with this, unless somebody has a question. You told me a story about a deal you did one time and somebody got murdered in the property. 
<laughs> and now this is again this is not a lease option probably but this this is some rental property that lou bought way back and some bad things happened there okay but lou survived okay lou wasn't the one that got murdered in the property tell, tell us what happened on that one do you mind it's just a crazy story and i want to hear it <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I'm, I was doing a rehab in Missouri, as a matter of fact. Wow, uh, where I live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, St. Louis, just so you know. Um, I still have the property, just so you know. Um, wow. So I just finished. I had it all done. My property manager put a, uh, put a tenant in. And in the first month, uh, she had called me back and said, uh, we have a problem. And I said, what's the, what's the issue? And she said, Someone was shot in the living room of your house. Oh. Blood everywhere. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so I said, and he didn't die there. He died in the hospital. But uh, because I was, I was concerned about, oh my gosh, someone died in the property. How am I going to get anybody in the property? I was, I was, I was going into like, do I need to get off like, a priest to bless the house? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do I need a priest to go over? You know, uh, demons be gone. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Had to replace the carpet. As you said, there was a big blood stain on the carpet and blood underneath the carpet, and so we had to repaint the floor and put new carpet in. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting. But I'm still here. And so yeah, and and ha and have you been able to re recoup from that incident and continue on and use the property as a rental property? Is that what you're using it for? Oh yeah. So so again, another really far out crazy example of something horrible that went wrong during a during a property deal, but these problems are al almost all the time solvable. Okay. Not not for the guy that got shot, but and that again, that's not the story that we're talking about in the ebook, but a separate story. But even in that case, you know, these things are 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 doable in a sense. Like you you can overcome a lot of things, all right. Even if it means you have to send a priest in and bless the house, all right. So don't give up. You are a problem solver, and when you embrace the problem solving aspect of your of your career here. You really are grasping what it means to be a real estate investor, a creative real estate investor. I am, I will just say, I'm very proud to work with Rico on this deal. I'm very, very proud to work with Lou on this deal. I'm very proud that what of the work that these gentlemen have done. And I'm very happy that we haven't heard from the seller. We haven't heard from the buyer, the tenant buyer, Eric. We haven't heard from anybody. What you know what that means? That means everybody's happy. Right? No problems. Okay? So go out and uh, get involved in the mess. Okay? Because that's where your money is. All right? I hope that makes sense, everybody. Any questions here before we close up? Any questions? Okay. All right. I love you guys. There's a special link i'll be emailing you and you can watch the replay of this if you need to you can get the copy of the ebook as well i'll be sending an email out to your email here shortly okay did you guys get anything out of this or did i bore the shit out of you okay because <laughs> it was a long it was a long thing man it was uh, kudos to you. all of you deserve a hug or an award or something for sitting here this long i bet your ass hurts and you gotta pee and everything <laughs> i big love you rico. big shout out to rico and rico did a great job yeah thanks rico thanks lou thank you everybody for being here you guys have a great rest of your weekend god bless you we'll, we'll see you again next time all right Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ty. William, Lou, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.